Thank you. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon and Gamsa uh, Hamnida for uh, being here and uh, listening uh, to, uh, to the uh, NXP story. I am I talking about that um, most of you know. Uh, we have last year uh, married Freescale, so NXP, the former Philips semiconductors and Philips, uh, and in, uh, Freescale, the, the former Motorola semiconductors have merged. Wedding day was December 7. Um, so basically, of course, what we what we have merged is uh, two uh, two successful companies, and that is important. I've seen a lot of merges in the past where one very strong and the weak company were merging, or, or even worse, where two weak companies were merging and hoping uh, the business gets better. This was not the case with the NXP Freescale merge, and yet you see it here. We had a lot of number one positions uh, all over the place, but basically the most important is we are the biggest automotive semiconductor provider in the meantime, so we have a 14% market share, Renesas and Infineon are at 9% on uh, number two and number three. Um, but we also uh, have a number one in microcontrollers now, microprocessors, and in security and uh, crypto controllers. And, uh, I, will, I will talk mainly about those three items going, going forward. So what that means for business unit automotive, we are uh, about out of this 10 billion company, we are 4 billion of the business. Uh, we are the biggest automotive semiconductor supplier, as I said, we have 30 sites, 30 um, uh, sites worldwide, and uh, our, our development team uh, is in the range of 2,500 engineers. So pretty massive, and it was of course good for me, but also, also uh, my difficulty is that's, that's pretty complex. The good news is that we can cover all three trends in automotive, so the main innovation in the automotive industry is of course in that seamless connectivity. Everyone wants to be connected like in your living room, you want to talk to anyone you choose by a phone uh, in a seamless way, you want to listen to content, you want to uh, watch video, you have, uh, want to have perfect traffic information. So this is basically an area where the old NXP was, was pretty active. Then the other part is of course this energy efficiency, so not only Volkswagen wants to have, uh, have engines uh, that are as clean as possible, but of course uh, uh, this is uh, towards the electric drivetrains, a very, very strong trend. And also big markets like, like China especially are pushing of course with uh, electric scooters uh, and, and uh, electric vehicles in the mega cities uh, very much into, into that domain. Um, and the, the most uh, uh, interesting one uh, for me is basically that trend here in the middle, which is basically converting the traditional car into a self-driving car. And doing that basically in a way that you, are, um, yeah, that you are able to drive more stable. So for me, the reason why this is uh, the most interesting for me as a person is every year, 1.3 million people die on the roads of this planet and more than uh, 50 million severe accidents happen. As far as, far as I have it on my mind, this means more than 5,000 killed people every year in Korea and more than 300,000 heavily injured people alone in Korea. And there is, of course, countries like in, in India, for example, where the traffic conditions are much worse. Uh, these these uh, rates are, are even, uh, even way higher. But, of course, for me as an engineer, how cool would it be if I can make a contribution in saving a significant portion of, um, uh, of these lives and in making sure that moms and dads are, are coming, coming home every night again to their families? How do I need to do that? Well, on the top level, the answer is very, very simple. Get the human out of that equation. 94% of all these heavy accidents are created by human beings, so they are not created by uh, equipment failures or a broken tire or whatsoever, and they are usually recognition errors, decision errors, or performance errors. And if I can take the human out and let a robot drive the car, then I have of course benefits, because under ideal conditions that robot never is tired, never is fighting with the kids in the back seat, never has an argument uh, with husband or wife uh, on the, on the co-driver seat, never is drunk, never gets emotional in the traffic jam because he needs to be uh, faster in the office. 
And what we have seen is all these, these uh, fatality trends went down over the last 20 years. Unfortunately, in the last two years, they spiked up again. So we have more killed people since two years again on the road. And the answer is because human beings start texting on mobile phones. If you are using your mobile phone while driving, the likelihood that you commit a fatal error or have a, having a heavy accident is 4 zero, 40 times higher than if you don't have your mobile phone in your hands. So in other words, if you have a robot that is very, very predictable and is only focusing on emotionless driving on the roads and having a good surround view, yeah, then you can get rid of a lot of these, these issues. Well, how do you come to self-driving cars? There is two ways, basically, that we are seeing. Traditionally, by the existing car makers. So the existing car makers, they have built since 150 years now horse carriages that by accident have a combustion engine. And from there, of course, we are developing in more and more assistance systems slowly. First, uh, you have uh, adaptive cruise controls. Uh, so sometimes you can take your feet off the pedals. Then you have uh, partial automation under uh, certain conditions. You can take the hands off the wheel. And then you have, under restricted uh, conditions, of course, a, a highway chauffeur self-parking until you reach the complete self-driving. But there is new entrance in the industry, and we just discussed it, of course, California is one of the, uh, at least, think tanks, uh, I would not say industry centers, but from this side here, people are coming into the equation that have built robots so far, industrial robots, and they say, okay, uh, forget about the horse carriage with a motor, but I have a robot that by accident has wheels. So I'm really looking here and I have a complete IT system and what do I need to do to make this IT system as, as uh, robust as possible? So this whole traditional thinking of a car and, and why a car has to look like a car is broken there. And especially a very painful thing for, uh, I would say in all fairness, uh, I'm German, I'm allowed to say this, for the arrogant southern German industry uh, saying uh, the, People like Tesla cannot build cars uh, with electric drivetrains because they don't have the experience of building drivetrains was maybe one of the most arrogant assumptions that I've ever heard in our industry uh, uh, clubs there in, in, in Germany. Because even if you're sitting on 100,000 man years of experience of exhaust gas regulation and how to handle a combustion engine, Tesla doesn't need that. They are disruptive, and they come from also from, from that drive train side in a totally new area because no one has a lot of experience on electric drive trains at the moment. Yeah? So with all of that, we are seeing here in that area a huge change, and I promise you the next 10 years are much more massive change than the last 50 years in, uh, in automotive. Coming back to the self-driving robot, what does that mean? Well, a self-driving robot, of course, will only be accepted in public and you have seen that in the press there had been uh, accidents uh, in the last week's uh, uh, fatal accidents with the uh, yeah, uh, uh, piloted uh, cars. Uh, a self-driving car will only be uh, accepted if of course these sensors are better than a normal human being under all conditions. That's the, uh, that's the, the clear uh, topic. What that means is you need to have a lot of sensors so your, your eyes, ears, hands, uh, senses of a, of a human being need to be replaced by senses that are always better than our human senses. Which means that you have, for example, um, uh, cameras to replace my eyes, but cameras are not enough. You're having redundant sensor systems in there as well. So when the camera is blinded by the light, I still have a complete radar cocoon. And ideally, of course, completely around the car for hundreds of meters. Outside of the line of sight, I have car-to-car -car communication. This is one of the key topics that we're going to talk about today. And of course, uh, ultrasound, laser scanners, uh, and the like. So this is getting pretty complex. And the good news is, from a silicon perspective, NXP, after that merge with Freescale, has all chips to build these self-driving robots. 
So in other words, we have the sensing side, we have the thinking side, so we have fusion machines. I'm gonna, gonna tell you about that uh, in a minute. And then of course we have the, the actuators, so the arms and legs of the car, plus we have the, the neural network, the in vehicle network, so can link flex ring, Ethernet, to send the data between the various blocks. And what you see here is always these tiny little door locks. This means we have also the security expertise of course, from our system uh, business unit. So that's that's the part of the self-driving car, and I will I will not deeply go into that. But what I mentioned the last time uh, also here in, in Seoul was, of course, we have a very nice infotainment portfolio as well. So 19 of the top 20 radio and navigation system makers using our our chips. So we have very nice um, uh, software-defined radio offering, one chip radios. In the meantime, we are market leader for car access solutions like the BMW display key is completely coming from us. We have the infotainment uh, processors and the amplifiers. And just to give you one example what the semiconductor industry is doing at the moment, or what is basically the value proposition of semiconductors is, you all know the big fat radios, navigation radios, 2 din radios that um, yeah, you had in the, in the last 10 years in your car or that you still have in your car. Three weeks ago we have taped out a one chip, which is uh, codenamed uh, internally the Mercury, and this Mercury I, I'm gonna pass around. So it has the, the, the size of a, of a thumbnail, and this thing is a complete AM, FM digital radio. So satellite and terrestrial uh, digital radio. That thing has six tuners and the baseband, and it is software programmable. So in other words, that thing is a complete highest end radio system. You can solder it into your shark fin antenna under the roof and just downstream your, your audio data then that, that you have received. And basically you're saving a lot of cables, of course, between the antenna and the, uh, and the, and the radio. And you have it all, you can imagine, uh, way cheaper, of course, way more robust, uh, much less uh, PCB space and, and system cost uh, if you up integrate it in this way. And this up integration game, this is what NXP as a company also is, is trying to do on, for all other systems. So we are taking basically the various building blocks, trying to bring this into one chip and make a, a cost down, uh, power efficient system because also of course the, the compute power that you need for such a type of radio is of course orders of magnitude lower than you would have built the radio in, in discrete components. So. We will see this here, and I give you a, a few more of those examples also from the from the ADAS part. Um, what is coming on top of, of that is, of course, also we have the device reliability. We try to to get the, the human beings out of the equation, as I said. The devices, every chip has to be as robust as possible to keep the quality up. But what we are seeing as well now is coming in functional safety. So the car makers have to look at under all conditions my car has to be as robust as possible, so even a failing power steering or a failing engine must never create a fatality. And newest thing is, and you have seen this uh, also in the last year, under all conditions, even if a car gets hacked, it must not be able to create a fatal accident with that. So we are not getting only a discussion like in the ISO 26262 on functional safety, but also about hacking security, hacking robustness. And as said, we have quite some footprint here in the, in the security domain, but with all of that, the automotive industry, the automotive chip makers are, are generating their value. And this is by our big share, so this 15%, 14, 15% market share in automotive are for us so valuable. Because it's not only a consumer electronics type of chip and uh, chip and, 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 and uh, sell it, and you have your x percent price erosion per year. But here is true value, of course, that we are bringing to the industry, and that we can make make money out of it. Why is that also so important? But very simple. Last year was not only the all-time high of car sales; it was also the all-time high of car recalls. So the issue is the car industry had shipped. Uh, uh, yeah, millions and, and tens of millions of cars, but had to call back quite significant amounts. And this is, of course, a disaster for the car makers. And you see here uh, the, the airbag story on Takata Airbags and so on. Those, of course, very high in the press. 
uh, keys from, from GM and, and so on. There was, there was quite a lot of, 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 of big reports. And what I'm gonna, gonna do now is I, I'm gonna hop onto a couple of examples. And of course, please stop me wherever you, uh, you have a question. But the first question, uh, the first thing that I wanted to, to show you is basically our radar systems and where we are with the radar systems in the meantime. So we have made quite some, some nice progress there. We had started after our radio one chip story to also go into 80 or 77 to 81 gigahertz, I have to say, radar chips. These radar chips are used now around the entire car. And these radar chips are the radar sensors, the radar systems, are getting smaller the higher the frequency is, because then your antennas get smaller with the higher frequencies. What you want to have is, so in automotive we had 24 gigahertz radar systems. Now we are moving to this 80 gigahertz band, and with that the antennas get way smaller. Now we need to shrink the chips and need to make the overall sensor much more power efficient and, and tiny. The only issue was in normal technologies, 80 gigahertz are hardly doable. We are the first ones worldwide who have a normal CMOS chip out there that can do this 80 gigahertz send receive. And at the moment, our engineers are busy combining that, so this NXP chip, with the Freescale radar microcontrollers to coming, ideally, to a radar one chip system. And you have a small, tiny radar stem. And I'll, I'll have this around here, maybe. This way. So this is basically the radar module. You see the, the, the tiny little antennas, and you see the, um, the, uh, the sentry receive functionality. We have played with that chip since two years with Google. So Google is gluing that uh, uh, to their uh, existing cars and uh, to these little uh, tiny rolling phone booths. And uh, that works well. And what we have uh, also done in these uh, partnerships with our lead customers, there is a, a bunch of others, and we have the first big design wins uh, scored on, on these systems now. So we will be in the market uh, volume production in 2018, or uh, end, end of next year. Um, so what we, what we have there is basically um, also the capability of gluing more than one of those chips together and you have four or six or eight of those systems sending simultaneously and receiving simultaneously and that basically creates a very very high brightness radar system. So we can do both. We can do the small and tiny up integration in the radar stems and we can build high brightness radar systems where you have 12 send and 16 receive channels, for example, where you can very, very clearly detect um, uh, obstacles. Our radar sensors are accurate enough to detect in a big room, so over 15, 15 meters, a beating heart. Why do you need that? Well, of course, you can do even room occupancy detection for that, but you also can do these radar systems, uh, put these radar systems to, uh, to traffic lights, for example, to do pedestrian detection. While, they are, while, while people are walking on a, on a walkway and if the traffic lights are red, you can, you can warn by a car to car communication the other cars. So this little radar stamp that I had shown you is a very nice example. It is basically a combination now of NX, perfect NXP and, and uh, uh, old NXP and old Freescale silicon. The NXP transceiver, the Freescale microprocessor. And those two are going to merge uh, over time into a, into a one chip. The great thing for me is, if you turn around that module, you have the power management ICs from Freescale, and you have the networking ICs, so CAN and Ethernet from old NXP. So if you would ask me for one example how the merged company can create value, that's of course a perfect picture, you know? So basically, uh, none of the companies could have done it alone. Together, we have a complete sensor system. And companies like Heller in Germany, they have publicly announced already uh, three weeks ago that they exactly take this form factor, these type of sensors, um, uh, and they, they call it compact trader, uh, in, a, in a 70 gram box, little plastics carrier, uh, and it can be ordered uh, uh, from now onwards for cars, and of course, uh, we're going to start mass production then, uh, then end of next year. 
Yeah. So that will hopefully for us be a very attractive business. There is car makers that are forecasting that they need between 10 and 20 of those systems for a good radar cocoon around the car. And good radar cocoon means that you need to have a good 360 degree <coughs> coverage because otherwise you might, might over, overlook obstacles. And uh, that of course must, must not happen as, uh, as we had seen in the press uh, some, uh, some uh, weeks ago. Yeah, and then of course a topic that is, uh, that is very close to my heart and every time I had been here in, in uh, Seoul uh, in the last three years I've talked about that topic already. And um, this is car-to-car -car communication, so automotive Wi-Fi. And again, so this is hard to see what's inside, but this is the form factor of these, of these modules, of the car-to-car -car modules that we are using. And uh, the great thing is we have in the US quite a lot of business development. We had in Europe quite a lot of business development and wrestling. How good is that standard? How, how, how uh, good will it be? We have tested in Ingolstadt with Audi on their racetrack over 2.3 kilometers of distance. We are talking to traffic lights in field trials. And then we are getting overtaken by Korea. Fortunately, really at a, at a fast pace and, and our business development teams here and the company Isis have done a fantastic thing here because for the Olympic Winter Olympic Games 2018 there will be a, a 90 kilometer route equipped with 802.11p. Where basically uh, you have you have uh, yeah low latency <coughs> car connectivity and how that uh, how that can benefit the user I'll uh, I'm going to show you in a, uh, a few videos uh, going forward. The idea is of course to on the one side getting warned of obstacles much earlier, getting on the other hand informed how to drive. So if you're approaching a traffic light at full speed and the traffic light knows already I'm going to stay red for the next minute, yeah? yeah, then don't accelerate. Try to recuperate your energy, slow down and go to a certain average speed, 30 kilometers to be exactly there when the traffic light switches to, to green and all that stuff. So smoothen the flow and uh, uh, thereby avoiding traffic, uh, traffic jams as well. So I personally, I'm, um, I'm, I'm very keen being one of the first persons uh, to be on that, uh, on, that, uh, on that road as soon as it's open, and I want to experience all the, all the use cases. And what can these use cases be? Well, very simply, it's of course, do not pass warnings for motorcycles, yeah? That's important for me, but even more important for the guy on the motorcycle. If I'm behind a truck, and I want to pull out and just overtake, and I'm getting the warning behind the truck already, Lars, don't do stupid things, there is a fast motorcycle approaching you. Okay, then I stay, of course. So this is communication outside of my line of sight. No human being, no radar sensor, no camera can do that, because it's outside of the line of sight. The other thing is, of course, I can see through obstacles. So I, I can see three or four cars ahead, there is a road construction unit, I get the warning there as well. Seeing around corners, yeah? I can see what's coming here. If there is a fast ambulance shooting into the crossroads here, or, or a crazy driver, uh, then I get, I get warned, and my car can calculate the point of no return for the crash, so it can break earlier. And what is coolest, and uh, we're gonna show you a few videos on that uh, uh, towards the end of the presentation, is truck platooning truck company, but we have also the Volkswagen companies like Scania, uh, MAN, and, and uh, six other truck companies in there. They were using our radar chips, and they are using our car-to-car -car V2X modules. And what they achieved to do, so these, these uh, figures have never proved over time, the trucks can follow each other at 80, ki eight zero kilometers an hour, 11 meters distance. And when the first truck does an emergency braking, all the others are within 0.3, so not 0.5 seconds anymore, but below half a second active with their brakes. Just <coughs> imagine that with human drivers. So what, what that means is we have five milliseconds of time to send the message from the first truck to all the other trucks, A, I'm doing an emergency brake now. Five milliseconds. And what that means is this truck sends the message, emergency brake, and then also digitally signs this and says, I'm truck number one. So in other words, it shows his passport and says, this is a legal message of truck number one. Because otherwise, 
if you would not have these authorized authenticated messages, of course, I could always fake uh, that I'm an, um, an ambulance and talk to every traffic light and say, hey, switch for me to green and I'm faster. That is, of course, not how that system could ever work. So that whole communication is I'm sending a message. I'm digitally signing that. This is truck number one. And then it goes everywhere. And the other trucks are receiving that message, are decoding that message, are verifying that message. And all of that, three to five milliseconds. And then the message has to be sent to the braking system. Brake. And the brakes are moving and are at the wheels. And all of that, 0.3 seconds. Normally, we are calculating for a human driver. You see the brake lights coming up of your car in front of you. It takes you one second to realize, oh, brake lights. Put your foot on the brake and react. So this is at least 1.5 seconds up to having that, uh, that, that same reaction achieved. So now you can assume, just calculate, over five trucks that delay chain, or you have between truck one and truck five, 0.3 seconds, because this is of course not adding up between the trucks anymore, because each truck, after five milliseconds, has that message. So it is much more being prepared and avoiding accidents by being better prepared. Yeah? And uh, this is of course especially for, for dense traffic for, for truck platoons, uh, quite an interesting thing. And maybe JS will be going into that to that other uh, other video for a second, so that you can see how that how that uh, looks in, in in real life. Still one one of my goals for this year, because some of my friends they reported to me that it feels pretty strange. Normally in traffic, we as as human drivers, we are used to the first truck is braking, and I see the brake lights, and then my car of course comes closer to that car. Here in, in these trucks, it is, you see the brake lights, you're, you're feeling the restraint system coming up, so, so holding you back, but basically the distance stays, because it's always these 11 meters. The first one is completely on the brakes, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, so they are all moving in, yeah, we call it as virtual tow bars. So they have between the trucks, like a, like a like truck and trailer, a tow bar, and this is of course the virtual one, yeah. So that is, uh, that is the stuff that, uh, that I find uh, extremely attractive at the moment. And uh, yeah, uh, so the good news for us was out of these six truck companies that had participated in these trials in, in Germany and the Netherlands, four used our 802.11p systems and basically the same electronics that is, uh, that is uh, installed here uh, on, the, on the Korean uh, so what does that mean? We have globally a lot of activities running, and then this is over, over the various uh, uh, countries. I said, I got completely surprised by how smooth and fast Korea was moving here with the innovations. We had since uh, 2005 field trials in Japan. Uh, we are discussing uh, in Singapore for succession of, of the ERP system. Yeah? Uh, China made some field trials. Europe was debate, typical European uh, thing, of course, Europe was debating for quite a while uh, how to do it with all the various member states, but there is cooperative uh, uh, test beds running, there is cooperative uh, topics like the, the truck platooning. And then at CES in Las Vegas, this year we had a booth, we have the big pitch there, and one of our lobbyists, US lobbyists, came and said, Lars, can you talk to two guys out of Washington? I said, yeah, okay, another lobbyist from Washington, a guy that pitched uh, to those, uh, those guys. And then in the evening, I received an email, can you please close down your booth tomorrow lunchtime for an hour? And he said, of course we cannot. All, all the big shots from, from uh, HKMC and, and from LG are, are planned for tomorrow lunchtime. So uh, we have executive meetings. Uh, why? Yeah, well, because Mr. Anthony Fox, the U.S. Minister of Transport, and his whole staff would like to visit you. What I did not know is that two guys had not been lobbyists, but had been employees of uh, the U.S. Minister of Transport. They saw our stuff and they and they looked at it and, and uh, they liked it. This is the U.S. Minister of Transport, Mr. Anthony Fox. This is the Klemmer, my boss boss, and this is Kurt Sievers, my boss. So he's the, the head of all of our uh, automotive business, and Rick is uh, heading the, the company. And this was the, the NXP truck in Las Vegas. 
So literally that whole team of the US Department of Transport came in, they talked to us and they said, you know what, NXP has great technology, literally I'm, I'm citing, NXP has great technology but no one knows you, probably we're going to help you here with a few field trials. And said, okay, have you understood it correctly that the US Minister of Transport is doing business development for us? Uh, was of course a, fu a fun joke there. No, it was not a joke because Anthony Fox was at that moment setting up a, a, a competition between smart cities. So what are, who is the smartest city in the US? And there were cities who could apply for that and they would have uh, gotten a grant of um, 50 million US dollars for putting infrastructure into their city to make the city even smarter. And they, they were handing in concepts. We partnered with him, so, so uh, these two gentlemen had been on stage in Austin some uh, four months ago and announced this publicly, that NXP and the US Min uh, Ministry of, of uh, Transport are joining forces for this smart city uh, 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 contest. Columbus was the city that was awarded three weeks ago, and now, of course, we are, uh, we are heavily also uh, working on getting these this car-to-car uh, uh, innovations but also other things like long-range RFIDs, intelligent license plates, uh, in, so I'll uh, probably uh, give you a, a bit more insights uh, towards the end when we, when we have that time. But all in all, a very good thing. How did that whole car-to-car -car business come to, to, uh, to existence? Well, what we have on there is one of the, of the early, early uh, systems of software-defined radio that we had. So that Mercury chip that you had just seen me passing around is one offspring towards the software-defined radio, AM, FM digital radio section. And what we have here is we have used the same technology for software-defined car-to-car communication. The good news is we have one silicon then and we can exchange the firmware. So if you need a Japanese standard, uh, if you would need Korean flavors, uh, German flavors, uh, US flavors, who cares? Change the firmware. But you do not have to requalify and then change the chip, which is good because these chips are not easy to make. They are multi-10 billion uh, million dollar uh, uh, R&D investments. And why? Uh, because they have to survive in a shark fin antenna on the roof. They have to be not only robust in terms of cross-radiation and disturbance, but also temperature-wise. They need to be pretty robust. Otherwise, uh, we have to do a lot to, to encapsulate the chips properly. So that whole thing is in place. And of course, we are dreaming at the moment with that software-defined radios, software-defined car-to-car communication, to come to the software-defined radar. And this is what I had shown you prior. These one chips, freely programmable, um, and NXP is a, is a bit running on that, how much can we do software defined and how can we master bringing the front ends, so the transmitters and the base bands together into one chip solutions. So much on the sensor side, yeah, but uh, what do you do with all that sensor information if you don't have a brain, yeah? You have eyes, you have ears, you have a nose uh, and cannot calculate a advice for the robot out of that, that does not work. Yeah, so in other words, the car needs a brain. And what we have there, you, you have seen it here, it is called sensor fusion, and here is the word blue box. What we have done in automotive is we have looked in the company and have taken the various silicon that we had. We in automotive had automotive micro uh, controllers, very heavy duty microcontrollers uh, for, for uh, uh, functional safety, very robust uh, operation. And then we have a sister division which is called Digital Networks. And Digital Networks deals with huge cloud computing, server farm, microprocessors. So 80,000 DMIPS devices, so um, uh, really uh, dry stone uh, uh, MIPS, uh, heavy duty uh, co uh, computation devices. And these two chips together, if you take them, so uh, uh, safety, relevant microcontroller with all the car connectivity and the cal uh, calculation monster, so an 8-core ARM machine together, they are of course a perfect combination for a brain of a car. So you have supercomputing and safe computing to make sure that even if something goes wrong here, the thing does not drive off the road. You have the octocore, 70 to 80,000 depending on which version you are using, uh, DMIPS system and the 10,000 DMIPS system as the second chip in there. And why is that thing called Blue Box? 
but because all the developers were starting with a 19-inch blue developer track in their laboratories. We are having this at the at four of the five biggest car makers of the world. We are having this at the moment at a lot of tier ones, and what is even more important at the software companies, because what we need is, of course, we have an open Linux-based system at the moment, so universities can bring their recognition algorithms onto that system. It is made out of components that are already qualified, so it is shipping, it is usable in the automotive industry. The good news is, of course, that you are having on your, developer, uh, on, on your development desk next to your laptop as a development system, it's using the same silicon as the in-car system stand. It has only 40, 40 watts of power consumption at these 90,000 units. And that's the important thing. There have been a lot of other companies out and they easily come with systems of 250 to 300 watts water cooled, which is pretty nasty for, a, for an in-car operation. Point one, it is very expensive having these water cooling systems. Point two, you might want to have even two of those systems for redundancy in the car. Yeah, then you're having 600 watts of power consumption on average in the car. This is not exactly a green driving, eco driving. And for a lot of normal ADAS functions on it, four steps, so it's level two or three, you don't need the full-blown system, but you need a smaller system. So with a system of 40 watts power consumption, we are very, very attractive with these type of, um, uh, of partitionings. And we have, of course, as these chips are used for cloud computing, for big uh, network routers, and in, um, uh, in the car um, uh, functional um, safety area, we have secure elements and security architecture already on all of these chips so that also hacking security, this functional security, is immediately inbuilt there. And at the moment we are shipping these, uh, these devices uh, and, and a lot of uh, players are, are um, putting, putting their development code on. This is of course not how it will end up in a car, consider it just as a development platform at the moment, but I think that's exactly spot on in the industry what is needed. And uh, well, you see it also, there was uh, around the FTF event in Austin, uh, some, when was it, four or five weeks ago, mid of May, um, was uh, a lot of press coverage on that. For all of that, what you need is, you need, of course, uh, <coughs> strong data connections. Well, and um, uh, I've, I've introduced this uh, a few times uh, here already. NXP is marking the for Canlin and Flexray, so basically in this in vehicle networks around the wiring harness, we have of course a lot of volume. And the next thing is 100 megabit Ethernet and even higher data rates. So basically what we have uh, released beginning of this year is Ethernet physical layers and Ethernet um, switches, so that you can build complexer uh, network architectures and of course the the, the key topic is uh, these wiring harnesses are getting more and more heavy, more and more complex. So this is of a, of a low-end car, a 30 kilo wiring harness. The Mercedes S-Class has, has a wiring harness that is more heavy than I am. Yeah. And uh, of course what, what have we done is we have taken the normal Ethernet, but normal Ethernet doesn't do the job because you have a four-wire system. We wanted to have a lightweight two-wire system. We have licensed this standard from Broadcom, so a two-wire 400 megabit. Uh, standard and have developed our own automotive grade chips out of that minus 40 to 100, uh, 25 degrees uh, robust mm -hmm. with a lot of diagnostics functions and that is going to make it into the car <coughs> and basically what that means is you are seeing at the moment that a normal car 10 years ago had one CAN bus and a few control units hooked up to that CAN bus that was the network of the car in the meantime, the cars have 200 or 250 control units. So the big ones, of course, the, the ultra-high and the cars. The W7 series, Mercedes S class. So a normal car today looks like a complete office building 10 years ago. You have 200 rooms, all need to get connected somehow because all of these rooms control units have a certain compute power internally, so they are, they are computer systems. And suddenly, a car network looks a bit like an IT floor plan of an office building 10 years ago. You're having one main router, or 
a central gateway. You are having different branches of your building. Yeah? So the engine compartment, the, the infotainment branch, uh, uh, your advanced driver assistant uh, functionality, uh, car access, and so on. And then you have sub-branches in there again. So basically, what you, uh, the, what you have then is from these body domains, you have, of course, access to, to certain actuators. But what you have is you compartmentalize your areas, just sketched here. And each of those areas is then a normal Ethernet network again. And some of the sub-branches, for example, here you see some of the sub-branches can be Kenlin and, and uh, uh, FlexTrack again. Yeah? But very, very complex. The good thing is each of those ECUs needs at least uh, one, if not more, uh, of the physical layers and of the, of the switches. And that's leading to the, to the last important part is, is functional security. The whole robot that I have explained now to you needs to be secure. And I said already for the car-to-car -car communication, you need to have that security to making sure that my car cannot cheat in the system. But also for telematic systems, you have uh, for sure uh, read in the press last year the, the famous Jeep hack where hackers from NSA could hack into a telematics unit and then could move into the entire car. So it was basically such a, such a car network. You could hack into the telematics system and then via the car, the canvas, you could move everywhere in your building to stay with a building example. Here, of course, you need to have security. So you need to have heavy duty, to stay with that house example, heavy duty uh, protection at your entrances of your house. In the entrance hall of your house, in your gateway, so assuming you have a very complex house with 200 rooms, now again, so you have a castle. In the entrance hall of your castle, you have these, these gateways. NXP is market leader for these gateway chips, and we are adding there a lot of crypto security directly into these gateways to make sure that if someone is entering here, he cannot easily via that gateway go into a different branch of the network. So you can. In other words, if you enter the infotainment wing of your castle, not get into the engine management wing of your castle anymore. So the Jeep hack of last year, where you could go from the telematics system to the engine department and to the infotainment system, that would not work in that construction down there. And of course, what we're doing, each of those nodes, each microcontroller here, gets additional security. So basically what you have is, if you could come in here, you cannot move to the next neighbor, but for sure you cannot move to a room in a different wing. And this is at the moment what we are doing, and plus on top of that, we are basically uh, securing, of course, uh, also securing, we are checking the traffic on the networks here. Because if, for example, a trailer hook control unit shouts over this bus, hey, everyone, please lower the windows and open the doors, then we filter that out and we are checking and say, hey, trailer hook, how comes that you are sending that message? You are not entitled to send that message. And all that electronics we have out there, so what you see is there is not one size fits all security. Security is basically a function of all these components that we are discussing at the moment. And uh, but basically, of course, we are, we are heavily leveraging what we have in the car access domain where we are market leader for all these car key uh, solutions. And we are even exporting that to the IoT domain, so to smart meters, uh, uh, little crypto chips there. Uh, and of course, we are trying to, to integrate this into, into all, uh, all use cases. And this is, uh, this is my, my famous slide of what we are normally doing, uh, just to, to also showcase what is happening in the connected car domain. But connected cars are just very, very expensive things in the Internet of Things. Yeah. So this is trucks are negotiating with the traffic light and are, um, uh, are basically switching on the traffic lights. Then we have these little stickers here, RFIDs, that are readable over 20 to 0 meters. My daughter in Hamburg has one of those things in her school bag, so she's 11 years old. And when she approaches this traffic light here, the traffic light sees there is a school kid coming. And via this car-to-car -car communication that we are installing here now as well, the, the traffic lights can communicate back to the cars and say, hey, slow down, there is a kid at the traffic light. We had the same here in these bags of the people. This was a completely autonomous driving car on a German racetrack. 
and we had here a, a walkway installed on that uh, racetrack. So this car was, was racing laps on the on the racetrack, no one in the car, so just the car was busy with, it, with, it, with itself. And then the, the ladies here were carrying the bag, so the traffic light here could see the bag is coming, could send via V2X car to car communication the message to that car and said, pedestrians 200 meters ahead, you stop at the traffic light. And way before the radar sensors or the cameras of this car would have seen the pedestrians, the car was already slowing down and stopping. We had our discussions, this is Andy Greenberg, this is the guy who had the Jeep, and uh, we had our discussions with him at the Frankfurt Motor Show uh, last year on uh, talking about our, our security architectures. Forget about cars, we're talking about transportation. We can of course use the same car-to-car -car communication electronics again for doing anti-collision transponders for drones. Because you're flying the drone out of the line of sight, by aviation laws you have to have an anti-collision transponder in your drone. The only nasty thing is such a um, uh, normal anti-collision transponder has a weight of 10 kilos. So if you want to deliver a, a, a 3 kilo Amazon parcel, the drone never gets a lift off uh, because the battery is empty before you can move your anti-collision transponder. So this, this tiny little module, the, the car-to-car -car module here, can, can do that job um, uh, pretty easily. That one you have seen, the trucks you have seen. We are building at the moment with local motors a self-driving bus to just put all our electronics in. And even a 3D printed car we have. So a polymer car that is just printed in two days, the car is printed, we put the wheels on, we put an engine in, and we put all our electronics in. So um, uh, I think uh, next, next year um, uh, you can see that uh, on, on movies driving. And the last thing here is we are playing with students. So some of our students are building motorcycles, electric motorcycles. And the Dutch motorcycle group here wants to, uh, so students, they want to do that, that, that um, uh, bike here, uh, want to, to drive around the globe in 80 days. So electric cycle, super heavy, 450 kilos, I think, so really a monster, but electric driven. And why do I have this on the, on the page here? Uh, very simple because I have a ring here at my hand, and that ring was not a gift of my wife, but uh, I got this from my boss, so it sounds a bit strange. Uh, but that, uh, that ring, uh, and then you can have a look at it, that ring is containing NFC and security, secure element, like in a banking card. And what we are doing with that is, of course, if you have this at your finger, and you're touching the bike handle, it is working like an immobilizer. Only then you can drive. So the funny use case, yeah, like John Wayne comes out of the saloon, jumps on his horse and starts riding, is of course always very cool and every motorbiker wants to have that as well. It is very easy realizable if you have your ring at your finger, no one realizes uh, where your key is, and of course we are, we are putting that at the moment onto the market in, in countries like India, as well, where you have a lot of two-wheelers, but where the cost sensitivity is very high. So these passive keyless entry systems, for example, would be too, uh, too expensive for, for cheap two-wheelers. And uh, you just, uh, just have this here. So uh, we are using this also for, uh, that's my favorite example, for, for jet skis in the water. The thing is waterproof, uh, completely robust, and, and uh, if I'm falling off the, off the jet ski, of course, the engine can switch off. Uh, so very, very easy to handle. But what you see with that is, we are going with this connectivity electronics far beyond the normal use cases. And the last thing is what my daughter has in the, in the backpack. Of course, we can integrate also into license plates. And then the license plate can act as a contactless badge. Like this one here. Here I'm going to, to the office here. Hold it against the, the card reader and open, uh, open the, uh, the office. My car is doing that in Hamburg. So driving to the gate and say, hey, gate up, and I do not need the, the security guys anymore to, to look at my face and to believe me uh, that I'm last. So in, in, in a nutshell, um, uh, what we have is we have, we have all ingredients from A to C. NXP is spending significant effort, and you, you hear this in my storytelling, for going into system solutions and for inviting other people to play with our, with our chips, with our Lego blocks, with our reference designs. And the great thing is that the car makers at the moment are approaching us and saying, you bring all your reference designs, we car makers play with that, and then we go back to the tier ones. 
So it is very often not anymore the case that we go to the, the tier ones and the tier ones go to the car makers. No, the car makers go back to us, so up, upstream the value chain, and say, what do you have in terms of innovation in your research labs so that we can play with that and we can faster industrialize and then, uh, can differentiate against other, uh, others. Yeah? So that is basically the updates, of course, main updates on the V2X side, main updates on the Blue Box Fusion side, and on the radar side. So um, what I guess is, uh, yeah, next time I'm here, uh, there will be significant <coughs> updates in this ADAS domain for the self-driving driving robots. And uh, I hope that I can show you then at least movies of a self-parking NXP car <coughs> that is basically hoovering around and finding its parking spot. For itself, because that is my my next dream, so that I can jump out directly at the at the restaurant, and the car is washing, fueling, and uh, parking itself. Thank you. Are there any questions?